بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء سيد المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين The first question that I have been given for this session this open session of questions and answers on this 12th day of Rabi' al-Awwal the year 1436 at Masjid Khalifa in Trinidad is what's the question again? The 72 groups, Nam. The 72 deviant groups mentioned in the Hadith of Iftiraq, the Hadith of uh, Splitting, are these 72 groups all in the hellfire forever? And the answer is that from those 72 groups, there are those who will be in the hellfire forever. They are the ones who have split away from Islam after ascribing to it, and their deviation has led them into a bid'a mukaffira. Innovation which has led them outside of Islam. They are the likes of the Rawafil, they are the likes of the Ghulat uh, al Murji'ah, the likes of the Mu'tazila, uh, and uh, a number of like the Jahmiya and so on, the Qadariya. Uh, these are outside of Islam. These are outside of Islam according to uh, many scholars, yet they are counted from the 72 groups. Uh, so they are, as it relates to the Ummah, they are from the Ummah originally, but they have left the Ummah that is the Ummah of Istijaba. The Ummah that means those who follow the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they are counted as Muslims. Uh, they have left that Ummah because their bid'ah has expelled them from the religion of Islam. There are other groups of deviation. They are the likes of the, the Shia those whose tashayyu, those whose ascription to the Shia beliefs include preferring some Sahaba over the others, but not cursing some of the companions and not hating the companions, but rather preference for Ali over others, the lightest of tashayyu. Uh, certain uh, groups, like the scholars say, the Ashairah, the Ash'aris, and so on, these are the Khawarij as well. Uh, these are deviant groups from the 72 that their deviation is not mukaffira, it doesn't take them outside of Islam. However, they are not from the same sect because of their deviation. So whoever's deviation has taken them outside of Islam, then the, the meaning of them being in the hellfire is forever. And whoever's deviation takes them outside of Ahl Sunnah, but not outside of Islam, and they're in the hellfire, ibtida, and not eternally, but temporarily, and Allah Ta'ala knows best. Any text as a general rule that mentions that someone who does such and such is in the fire, it may be that that is permanently and eternally, and it may be that that is temporarily uh, and for a time. إِذَا الْتَقَى الْمُسْلِمَانِ بِسَيْفَيْهِمَا when two Muslims meet with their swords, meaning they fight, then the, the killer and the one who is killed is in the hellfire. So these are Muslims who have committed an act of kufr. This kufr is, as it has been described by the scholars of Ahl Sunnah, the kufr of the lesser type. So their entrance to the hellfire and their punishment in the hellfire is not a, an eternal punishment in the hellfire like those who have left Islam. Naam, and Allah Ta'ala knows best. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ma asfala min al ka'baini fa finnaar. The garments, for example, whatever is below the ankle, it's in the hellfire. Meaning the person who does that is in the fire. That is a sinful kind of behavior, but not something that nullifies a person's ascription to Islam. So these texts that warn of hellfire for the one who falls into certain kinds of sins, we understand these texts of sins as being less than shirk. And so therefore they are under the Mashia of Allah. In Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bihi wa yaghfiru ma duna dhalika liman yasha. And verily Allah, as he has said, what means he does not forgive that partners are set up with him 
yet he forgives anything less than that for those whom he chooses. So those texts which talk about being punished in the fire, they are threats from Allah and threats from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that can be executed and if they are executed, meaning if a person is to face punishment in the fire for those sins, then it is not eternal so long as he has not declared those sins to be halal or have some other thing along with that sin that indicates that he is outside of Islam and Allah Ta'ala knows best. Um, the what? The woman's husband uh, apostates and goes to Christianity? No, her husband from Christianity now accepts Islam. Okay. But she's already married to a Muslim man when she accepted Islam. Tayyib, when she accepted Islam, the Muslim judge. The question is about a Muslim woman who accepts Islam as a former Christian and she was married to a Christian man when she accepted Islam. The Muslim judge, the authority in the case, or the one who takes his place, he looks at the matter and he decides to give the man some time to accept Islam. He separates the new Muslim woman from her Christian husband temporarily and he is invited to accept Islam. This is what the scholars say. If he accepts Islam, then will be how na'am. He keeps his wife, the marriage is still valid and they live as a Muslim couple. If he doesn't accept Islam, they are separated, the marriage is annulled and she marries someone else when and if she chooses. Tayyib, if that happened, the Muslim authority annulled their marriage, her marriage was invalid because of the religion of the man, then she went and married another husband, then that marriage, the first marriage is over. If he later accepts Islam after some time and after thinking about it, and that is a married woman. To another man, that marriage is valid and he may not go back to his former wife unless she's divorced from that new husband and, you know, he finds a way to approach her for marriage when she is not married but because he accepts Islam it does not make her marriage that she entered into after her marriage was annulled with him it does not make that new marriage invalid at all and similar cases are like when a man is missing and the Muslim authority studies his case and makes a judgment on him that he's to be considered lost and presumed dead and this is very important because there's a woman there waiting she has to live her life, she needs taken care of. So when a man is missing for years and no one knows where he is, a judge may study the case and say there is no, you know, that most likely in this case he has passed away. So we will rule that he has passed away. When he rules that he has passed away, then her marriage is annulled. Tayyib, her marriage ends, she, she begins to take the, not that it's annulled, but she begins to go through the idda of al-mutawaffa anha zawjuha, the one whose husband died. After that happens, then she is not married to him. If she marries again, and then the husband pops up, and he's alive, right? That's a, that marriage is valid, and they have to deal with it. And Qadr Allah, this whole life is, face, is full of calamities, trials, losses, and difficulties. So even though he did nothing wrong, and he could complain and say, how could you take my wife from me, right? But the women have rights, and we have to maintain the women, and whether you are absent because of something that was your fault or you are absent because of the qadr of Allah outside of your abilities that woman still deserves to be maintained and taken care of and you have to understand that that people had moved on and such cases are very rare and they're sad when they happen but that's what happens when the judge intervenes and ends that marriage and rules on him that he has passed away and the scholars differ on that and that's why we have a need in our society for a Muslim authority so that he ends you know the decision his decision ends the matter and it is the one that everyone refer, returns to without that then the people they have a masjid and a student and this one they have another masjid with another student and then the student over here says that her marriage is over and the student in the other masjid says no the marriage is still valid and they differ and there is no clear authority over them to say this is the ruling that we have to follow you see how the life of a Muslim 
is not going to be smooth or organized and, uh, and have a final say in those affairs that people differ over without living under the Muslim ruler. And that's one of the main reasons that you should try to go to a place that has the rule of Islam under a Muslim court system and Muslim rule so that your affairs, all of them, can be you know, easily organized and you know uh, what to follow in certain cases. The other question? Did all the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam cover their faces? Right? And what's the ruling on wearing the niqab then? We just want to know historically if all the women of the... Which one is more virtuous between covering the face? And which is more virtuous versus covering the face and not covering the face? Yeah. Tayyib. In the case that it's not negative. The scholars differ about this and I don't know what is correct but the scholars differ over the niqab meaning covering the face, is it an obligation or is it recommended? When we say it's, uh, when we talk about the scholar's position to say it's recommended, that means it's virtuous, it's rewardable. So if the question is what is better wearing it or not, then every scholar agrees that it's better to wear it. No one differs over that. The differing is only between it, is it an obligation that you are rewarded for doing and punishable for not doing or is it a recommendation that you are rewarded for doing and you are not punishable for leaving off that's the differing so in both cases of the differing you are rewarded for doing it so if you're asking about doing it versus not doing it all the scholars would agree that it is virtuous and better to do it at least and some of them would say obligatory is it is it allowed for us to say that something obligatory is better for you to do is that allowed or do we have to say it's a must? Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu idha nudi alis salati min yawm al jum'ati fas'au ila dhikri Allah wa dharu al bayyah Thalikum khayrun lakum Thalikum khayrun lakum in kuntum ta'lamun That's better for you if you knew Is that recommended or an obligation? That's, far, that's a serious heavy obligation But Allah says thalikum that's better for you. Right? And if the people of the book had iman, that would be better for them. So it is permissible to talk about a matter that's obligatory as being better for you. So we can say everyone agrees here that wearing the niqab is better. Meaning either as an obligation or a recommendation it's better. As obedience to Allah is better than disobedience to Allah in a general way. And Allah Ta'ala knows best. Uh, yeah, you had a question about Mujahid. Uh, in a circumstance where it is, uh, you have the level of ilm and the different concern in the issue. This much, this much is different concern in the issue, a market issue. And the question mm-hmm. is to think about firstly the, to, to, to the ulama. So? What to do when masajid are under different students of knowledge and they differ? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you look to. You go to your scholars, um, you go to your scholars, you go to the scholars that have recommended uh, those students and if you find uh, a student that is recommended by a well-known scholar and the other one is not, then you go there. Um, If you find that one of them or both of them have actions that are known to the scholars and recommended by the scholars, meaning they are recognized and their call is something that is uh, you know, pleasing to the scholars and what they've been doing, then both are to be taken from and as long as they're both uh, busy with what benefits the people, then you take from all of them. However, if people are causing problems, if people are doing things that confuse the people, if people, for example, students of knowledge upon one way, upon the way of the Salaf, they cooperate amongst each other. If there are some that are spreading things against the others, then you avoid that. Uh, if there is someone who is, uh, you look for this, this, com- this happens so commonly that someone, uh, he's very critical of Ahl Sunnah, very, very critical of Ahl Sunnah uh, with heavy amounts of criticism, yet when it comes to Ahl Bidah, he makes a lot of excuses and he works with them and he cooperates with them. This is a very dangerous sign and it's one of the most common signs with those who may be popular with the people. So watch out for that one. 
uh, Nam, go to your scholars and ask. Uh, here are the questions from the sisters. Assalamu alaikum wa alaykum salam. Did all the wives of the Prophet wore niqab? I don't know. I would assume so, but I don't know. Historically speaking, uh, I would assume so, but I don't know. Number two, should one think that a woman who wears niqab better or more virtuous than the one who doesn't? Yes, because that's what we say about every outward action. We don't take any one action that is either recommended or obligatory and say whoever does this one is in general more virtuous than the one who doesn't. We say whoever does this action, then they are more virtuous as it relates to this action than this other sister. The other sister may have virtues that are more virtuous or she may have other actions that are more virtuous in other parts, in other, you know, um, uh, acts of the religion. So Allah Ta'ala is uh, wise in his judgment of the people and he will judge us all by all of our actions, not one action alone, not the action of our choice of clothes alone, and not the action of uh, certain deeds here and there, but everything he has ordered uh, us to do as worship, we will, all, we will be judged about all of those things collectively and comprehensively. So as well as when we deal with each other, we view each other and we, we regard each other as pious or impious based on the outward actions. So whatever woman amongst us wears a niqab, we regard that action as an action of piety. Right? And naam, and Allah knows best. What is your advice to the new female shahada, the new Muslim, uh, who rushes to wear niqab and get married? If she's rushing to wear niqab and get married for the sake of Allah, فَالْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ Then actions are but by their intentions. Wearing niqab is a virtuous deed and getting married is a virtuous deed. It's half of the religion. So if she's rushing to do virtuous deeds, judging her based on the apparent thing, we say, may Allah bless her and aid her in what she goes forth to do. Tayyib, if she is doing it out of showing off or things like that, then this will not be accepted from her. And she should, uh, you know, um, perform her actions with sincerity to Allah Ta'ala. And there are many women who accept Islam. And as non-Muslim women, they are tired. They are tired of dressing up and tired of doing their hair and tired of putting on makeup and tired of showing off for the men. They are really in their lives, they are exhausted. And a lot of women, they look at the Muslims and they see this hijab and they see this, you know, the, the covering and it's very attractive to them because they know these women are free. These women can relax. These women don't have to toil and exhaust themselves to keep themselves always looking beautiful for the men everywhere they go. But rather they can relax and then they beautify themselves for their husbands, right? But they can relax and they can cover themselves and they don't have to worry about every eye that's looking at them and do they look good enough and are they impressive and all of that. Those non-Muslim women, non women are tired and exhausted. And many of them come to Islam and they are so happy to finally just put something on and cover up and end this whole thing about worrying what the men think about them and so on. So it, maybe it's not rushing, maybe it's just a big sigh of relief a big breath of fresh air to finally get rid of you know all the dressing up and all the beautification and adornment for the men and so we should look at that as virtuous wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh and wearing niqab as well as we mentioned is a virtuous deed and getting married is something that will help her complete her religion so we should be encouraging new muslims to dress properly and to get married there's nothing wrong with that we shouldn't tell them slow down and stop and wait Maybe a woman would come to Islam and she's been missing the solid foundation in her life of a husband. She's been missing the completeness of a family and a, and a, marriage, a life of marriage. And so she's looking forward to that. And we tell her, slow down, give yourself at least six months before you get married or something like that. And then she doesn't have enough patience and she leaves Islam because her, she's not stable enough in her religion. That husband will come and take care of her and support her and give her stability and he also benefits from her and he gets stability in his religion as well and the husband and the wife support each other and complete each other as people so I don't see any reason to tell people to wait before getting married especially if we just return back to the simple easy system of Islam of getting married right where it's not this 
uh, you know, ex excessive spending, you know, a person goes broke paying for the wedding reception and these matters related to the wedding, but you keep it simple and on your level, whatever you have, you throw a wedding party, even if it's just by slaughtering one sheep and sharing it with a few people. If you had 10 people, 15 people slaughter one sheep, put some food together from that with a small amount of money, or even less than that. Some of the Sahaba used to hand out bread. They used to hand out small pieces of whatever they could put together when they couldn't afford a sheep. All of that is from the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that has been forgotten. And people overburden themselves with marriages today to the point where they make it so difficult on themselves that they have to wait and wait and save their money and all of that. But if we return back to the ease that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us, we would find خَيْرُ الصَّدَاقِ أَيْسَرُهَا The easiest dowry to pay is the best one. The sister who has a, not lowest, it doesn't mean lowest, but the easiest dowry. And so what that means is, if a rich man comes to marry her, and this man has a million dollars, she says, no problem, 50,000. And she takes 50,000, and he says, that's easy, no problem, you're worth it, and more, and he gives her 50,000, and it's easy. If a poor man who's pious comes, and he says, I only have $500 to my name, she says, okay, $100. And she makes it easy. Her wali assists her and supports her in making that easy. If she wants to marry a pious man who will help her get close to Allah Azza wa Jal. So in that is khair. And when you understand that khair al-sadaqi, aysaru, the best dowry is the one that is easiest to pay. And it's relative to people's levels of economic or financial you know, uh, levels. That it's the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who's telling us about this khayriya, about this goodness. That means it's the goodness that's with Allah. It's the goodness that's lasting. It's the goodness that has barakah with it, with blessings, and that makes the marriage successful. And so, taking the easy route and getting married, when Allah makes that easy for us, can be a source of a lot of happiness for us and a lot of ease in this life. Should she try to understand her religion first? Perhaps she may not be able to understand, understand her religion very well on her own. Let's say she has a non-Muslim family, she's alone. Let's say the sister's study circles where she attends are not very good or something. And she has an opportunity to marry someone who's knowledgeable enough to teach her about the religion. So then this marriage to this man is a way that opens up learning. And there are many sisters in a case like that. So we don't say learn the religion first before you get married. Perhaps she can't and getting married is the solution to learning, you know. Perhaps she would love to travel to visit women who are knowledgeable. But she can't travel. There's a new Muslim woman. She can't travel. She has no male mahram in her family, right, to travel to take her to these places, right. Maybe her family are all Christians and they don't want to take her anywhere. They don't believe it's important to uh, you know chaperone or take a woman somewhere outside of the country and if she gets married to a husband he would travel with her to places where she can learn from sisters or even learn from the scholars in places that have that set up for women and a lot of that opens up for people when they get married so don't don't assume that marriage means that you you learn less about your religion after marriage for many people it's the opposite and if you married one of the scholars or one of the students of knowledge, then you would find a lot more access to the knowledge than you had before you were married, right? And that's why a lot of uh, people recommend that you try to marry a scholar. It's from the best and most pious of the people are the scholars, those who truly fear Allah. So try to marry a scholar. If you can't marry a scholar, marry one of the students of the scholars so that you can learn your religion, have access to knowledge. And Allah knows best. Another question, there are no female colleges to train female doctors, nurses, etc. Can I attend a mixed school to become a doctor or teacher? Allah knows best. I warn you against intermingling and I encourage you to do your best to stay away from it and I can't answer your question. Uh, can a female have more than one wali for marriage? Can she have more than one wali for marriage, who come from non-Muslim families. The marriage contract has one wali. 
If you mean you had a wali and you were not happy with him, so you asked the imam of the masjid or you appointed yourself another wali, then that's permissible according to the scholars of Islam. But if you mean that you have a brother in Islam who's looking for a husband for you, who may or may not be the wali in the contract, then that's permissible. The believers, men and women, they are awliya of each other. They are the friends and maintainers of each other. So it is allowed for you as a man in the masjid. And you have a wife and you're not interested in getting married. And especially if you're older, the women would trust you a lot more. If you said, I'm not going to be the wali and anything, but I'll keep my eyes open for you. I'll look for a good husband for you. Just tell me what you're looking for. And she communicates with you to tell you that she's looking for such and such in a husband. And a sincere brother in Islam can help her look for someone without being the wali. The wali is needed for the contract. And there's one wali in the contract. I don't know of any basis for more than one wali in a marriage contract. But I don't think you mean that in the question. Tayyip. So I think you just mean a brother who's looking out for you to find you a husband. Right? And that doesn't have to be a wali. That's your brother in Islam, no matter who he is, would think about you. If the opportunity arises and he sees a husband that might take care of you, he says, yes, there is my sister in Islam at the masjid and she's looking for a husband of such and such qualities and I found someone, so I'll recommend him to get in touch with her family or with her wali. So someone doesn't have to be the wali to do that. And we are the protectors and maintainers of each other. and There's nothing wrong with doing something like that. And Allah Ta'ala knows best. Uh, can a female have more than... Okay, what are the rights of my non-Muslim neighbors who oppress me? What are the rights of my non-Muslim neighbors who oppress me? Like their rights are that you are kind to them, right? Uh, why? Because it's from the Iman in your religion. It's from faith in your religion to be kind to your neighbor and that is general including Muslims and non-Muslims whoever believes in Allah and the last day then let him be generous or be kind to his neighbor and it's well known that people harm you and there is no one in the dunya except they'll harm you to some degree and our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam summarized all of that the relationships between all people, even Muslims, amongst each other. In his statement, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, could you get those questions that came over the top there? Jazakallah uh, khayran. When he said, Al Mu'min alladhi yukharitu al nasa wa yasbiru ala adahum, khayran min al Mu'min alladhi la yukharitu al nas wa la yasbiru ala adahum. Jazakallah khayran. Jayyin. Uh, the believer who mixes with the people and he bears their harm patiently, he's better than the believer who doesn't mix with the people nor bear their harms. So mixing with the people, whether they be Muslims or non-Muslims, means that you will be harmed. That's the nature of people. There's harm with every person. There's no one that you will be with and it will be a pure relationship, absolutely full of sincerity and ikhlas and no harm ever, no relationship like that in the dunya. And I, I mention that because, wallahi, we need to have realistic expectations of each other. And when we think, because we're Muslims, and because our religion commands us to observe each other's rights as Muslims, then there should be no oppression, there should be no backbiting ever, there should be no harm, there should be no oppression. That understanding is flawed. That we are commanded to do that, but that will not happen. And there will always be harm amongst each other. We have to be ready to be harmed with our brothers. And we have to be easy, and we have to be lenient, and we have to be forgiving and overlooking. Right? Uh, Allah Ta'ala describes, very interesting, describes the believers, the pious people, as they are in paradise. He describes them saying, وَنَزَعْنَا مَا فِي صُدُورِهِمْ مِنْ غِلٍ إِخْوَانًا عَلَى سُرَرٍ and we plucked out of their chests all of the rancor that existed between them. Right? وَنَزَعْنَا مَا فِي صُدُورِهِمْ مِنْ غِلْ غِلْ is rancor and hatred and something between you and another person. And now they are brothers reclining back on raised up 
uh, couches facing each other. That's the brotherhood that's pure, wholesome, no harm, no, you know, no difficulty ever. That's the brotherhood in paradise. It doesn't exist in this life. This life is a test. This life is a test of your character, a test of your deen, a test of your stability, a test of, you know, who you are. And Allah Ta'ala has put you here to be tested. It wouldn't be a test if our brotherhood was pure and perfect like it should be in Jannah. That would be no test for us. Everyone supports us like they should. Everyone respects us like they should. Everyone recognizes our good just like they should. And no one ever transgresses or harms anyone. That's paradise. If you want that, that's paradise. But don't expect it here. Don't expect it here. Try your best to come close to that in your interactions with people. But be ready to practice your religion, the religion of patience and excusing people when they transgress against you personally. And as a contrast, when people transgress against the religion and they twist Islamic teachings and they misrepresent the Qur'an and the Sunnah, then you have no right to be ready to excuse that person. This is not your right to excuse that person. You hold that person to his teachings and you put every bit of pressure you have on him to make him repent and rectify his falsehood. And you have no right to say, no problem, we excuse you, because it's not your right in this case. Your rights are about your reputation, your physical safety, your money, things that are yours to forgive and to be easy about. But as it relates to the religion of Islam, the book and the sunnah and it being represented purely and properly, then we have no right to excuse anyone. That should be really clear. So when I talk about all this um, lovey-dovey stuff about excusing each other and being easy, I mean as it relates to personal offenses that do not include anything in the religion. Right? So when it comes to non-Muslim neighbors, if they were Muslim neighbors, they would harm you. And Allah knew that when He inspired His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to tell you that from you, your Iman, if you believe in Allah on the last day, then you have to honor your neighbor. And Allah knew that Muslims would have non-Muslim neighbors as well. And that is included in the statement of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to be kind to them. Now our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, look at his kindness. Kindness to non-Muslim neighbors, one of the first and foremost things out of kindness is to, to be concerned for them in what is most important in this life. And I have not created jinn or mankind except to worship me. So then you worry about your neighbor going to the hellfire. And you tell your neighbor about Islam and you show compassion and humanity for your neighbor. And you invite that neighbor to accept Islam. The Prophet ﷺ had a Jewish neighbor who put his son at the service of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was a servant. He was Jewish and he was a servant of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? And he had learned about Islam and he had known enough that when that boy, he was struck down early in his life by a disease and he was dying, he was on his deathbed. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to visit him. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in charge of conveying the religion to all of humanity fighting battles for the sake of that sending missionaries collecting zakat you know, all of these things as the Imam of the state the leader of the Muslims he went to visit his Jewish neighbor's dying son that is Ihsan that's honoring your neighbor and he didn't go and just say you know I'll miss him or be patient or anything. He gave him the very, very best ihsan and ikram that you can do. The very best kind of generosity and good treatment that you can do for the neighbor. And that is to try to benefit them in their hereafter. So he went to that boy who knew the difference between Islam and disbelief. He said to that boy, Aslim, accept Islam. And that means that Islam has been explained to him. He knows all the details of what it means to be a Muslim. So he told him, come on, accept Islam. The boy knew it was the truth and he looked to his parents, he looked to his father and his father became overwhelmed with concern for his son and he dropped his arrogance that would prevent him from 
accepting the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam or allowing his son to accept the messenger and in that moment of compassion for his son he said Abul Qasim obey Abul Qasim that's the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam obey him and he follow him accept Islam he accepted Islam and he died shortly after that and the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam came out of the house and he was happy he said alhamdulillah alladhi anqadahu Alhamdulillah, praise be to Allah, the one who saved him through me from the fire. That is an example of ikram, the job, and the honoring your neighbor. So don't think it means that you smile in the face of a disbeliever day in and day out, and you never say anything about what's happening in the hereafter for them. And that wouldn't be honoring your neighbor. That would be patting them on the back as you throw them in, you know, as they head face first into the hellfire. That's not appropriate. So you look for an opportunity along with your general good words and your, you know, your general kindness. You might send gifts. You might send a pie. You might send a cake or some fruits. You might send gifts here and there to your non-Muslim neighbor, which is permissible. It's something that might open their hearts to listen to you and to listen to what your message is. So for that sake, not just to make them happy and that's the end of it, but to make them happy enough to maybe listen to you, you could explain to them their need to accept Islam. And Allah Ta'ala knows best. So the rights of the non-Muslim neighbors are, are firstly and foremostly that you show them Islam in your practice. You embody Islam so they see Islam. You explain to them enough about Islam so they have the proof established on them. They know that there has been a messenger that has come, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Inviting mankind, just like the previous messengers, to worship Allah alone and to shun false deities and to abandon all worship to everything besides Him. And when you establish that, then you have done what is the most important essential right uh, that your non-Muslim neighbors have on you. When you carry, when you couple that with good speech, good behavior and general acts of kindness like gifts and taking care of your property so your property is not an embarrassment to the street or you do things that harm your neighbor. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the narrations of the same hadith, مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلَا يُؤْذِي جَارَهُ Then he, whoever believes in Allah on the last day, then let him not harm his neighbor. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Wallahi la yu'minu, Wallahi la yu'minu, Wallahi la yu'minu. He said it three times one day. I swear by Allah, he doesn't truly believe. He doesn't truly believe. Wallahi, he doesn't truly believe. And so they asked him who? He said, Man la ya'manu jarahu bawa'iqahu. The one who doesn't keep his neighbor safe from his atrocities. So what does that mean? Maybe throwing garbage out onto their property, maybe allowing bad smells or garbage or things like that to go on their property, maybe not maintaining, not maintaining your property well enough according to the standards of the street so that you're viewed as being the house that's falling apart or the house that is not being maintained or the grass that's not being cut or the property that's not being kept up like the rest of the people on the street. And in this way, this would be very harmful because it's not only harm to a neighbor, which is already sinful, but it would be something that would give these non-Muslims the feeling that they're better than you and that you are lower than them because you can't cut your grass or take your garbage out properly or keep your property clean. And they would look down on you because you're not taking care of your property. And then how would they listen to you if you come to them to tell them about Islam? And they're looking down on you because of your actions of not keeping up with the, uh, the amount of respect that the neighbors have for their property. So make sure that you're maintaining that as well. And Allah Ta'ala knows best. What is the hadith for women to wear black clothes? I don't know the hadith for women to wear black clothes. Are you? That's all the questions I have here in front of me. Oh, I'm sorry, there are two more here. Sorry, or two more papers. What are the rulings and method of performing istikhara, particularly regarding divorce? Tayyib. 
the question is coming from the sister, so I'm worried that we're in the Western lands and she's saying divorce, like the woman has the right to divorce. But if you mean for a man divorcing his wife, uh, then istikhara is the same in terms of an act of worship, it is the same for all decisions. There is no specific kind of istikhara for taking a job and a different kind of istikhara for doing something else. This, the thing that you ask for is inserted in the dua and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam according to the hadith of Jabir which is in Sahih al-Bukhari كَانَ يُعَلِّمُنَا لِسْتِخَارَةً فِي الْأُمُورِ كُلِّهَا كَمَا كَانَ يُعَلِّمُنَا أَسُورَةً مِنِ الْقُرْآنِ He used to teach us Salat al-Istikhara in all of our affairs like he would teach us a surah from the Qur'an so it's very important he would teach us to say Allahumma inni astakhiruka bi ilmin wa astakhiruka bi qudratik wa as'aluka min fadlik al-azim fa innaka ta'lamu wa la a'lamu wa taqdiru wa la akhdiru wa anta a'lamu al-ghuyub Allahumma in kunta ta'lamu anna hadha al-amra khayrun li fi dini wa ma'ashi wa aqibati amni faqdurhu li wa yassirhu li thumma barik li fihi wa in kunta ta'lamu anna hadha al-amra sarra li fi dini wa ma'ashi wa aqibati amni fasrifhu anni وَصْرِفْنِي عَنْهُ ثُمَّ رَزُقْنِي الْخَيْرَ حَيْثُ كَانَ أو وَرَزُقْنِي الْخَيْرَ حَيْثُ كَانَ ثُمَّ أَرْضِنِي لِهِ وَيُسَمِّي حَاجَتَهُ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam instructed us with that dua that is after praying two rakats فَيَرْكَعْ رَكَعْتَيْنِ مِنْ غَيْرِ الْفَرِيضَةِ He makes two rakats other than the obligatory prayers not salat al-fajr right but any two rakats other than the obligatory rakats. So he makes two rakats. And in his, either in his tashahud, meaning after the tashahud and before the salams, some scholars prefer this place, or after the, the salams, because of the word thumma in the narration, is that he, فَلْيَرْكَعْ رَكَعَكَيْنِ مِنْ غَيْرِ الْفَرِيدَ ثُمَّ الْيَقُلْ let him make two rakats other than the obligatory rakats, then let him say. So some scholars said that means at the end of the salah, after the taslim. Others said it means before the taslim. Either way, uh, make the dua that you have heard, which means, O oh Allah, uh, O oh Allah, I seek the khair from you uh, through your knowledge. And I seek good qadr from you, from your qadr. And I ask, وَأَسْأَلُكَ مِنْ فَضْلِكَ الْعَظِيمِ And I ask from your great bounties. اللَّهُمَّ إِنْ كُنْتَ تَعْلَمُ أَنَّ هَذَا الْأَمْرِ No, before that. فَإِنَّكَ تَعْلَمُ وَلَا أَعْلَمُ Because you know all matters and I don't know. وَإِنَّكَ تَقْدِرُ وَلَا أَقْدِرُ And you have قُدْرَ You have abilities, capabilities over all things and I don't. وَأَنْتَ عَلَّامُ الْغُيُوبِ And you know all things. So Allah, if you know this thing is good for me in my life, in the short term and the long term of it, then give it to me. Put blessings in it. Uh, what is it? Uh, Make it the qadr for me. Make it easy for me. Right? And then put blessings in it for me. And then the other way, إن كنت تعلم أن هذا الأمر شر لي في ديني وما عاشي وعاقبة أمري. If you know that this is a bad thing for my life, the long term and the short term of it, then turn me away from it and turn it away from me and lead me to the خير wherever it is and make me pleased with that good. And so he mentions exactly what it is that he's looking for or what she is looking for at that time. That's for marriage, for divorce, for any decision, the uh, bal, any decision of significance. That's the question about al istikhara. Can you offer some advice regarding the importance of taking notes during a lesson, and what are some etiquettes of aspiring, of the aspiring students of knowledge in these sittings? Barakallahu uh, feek. Note taking is different for different people. There are some people that when they take notes, they don't hear. And they don't, their listening goes down. Or the writing, the skill of writing blocks the listening skill. And there are some people who can balance between the two. And as they write, they're still listening. If you find yourself to be from the people who, when you write a note down, 
the listening is either weakened or absent. And so you miss things as you're writing. Then I advise you not to take notes and to pay attention diligently. Get the point there? Because it's better to hear something beneficial and not be able to recall it precisely through notes. But it's there, you did hear it, and you could remember it. It's possible to remember it. It's possible that when you need it, you remember that issue, even though you didn't take notes. Versus the one who is busy taking notes about one point, and another point never really came in the ears because the ears were shut down while the writing happened. So in that case, there's no chance for you to remember that point because it never entered while you were busy taking notes. So look at yourself if you're a person who can easily take notes while your listening remains active, then do your best to take notes. If not, then try your best to pay attention devoutly and perhaps jot down the main points after the session is over uh, or review the recording without relying on the recording. And our ulama advise us about that, to not sit back and say, I've got the recording going, so whatever. I don't need to pay attention, I don't need to take notes. Everything's on the recording. And that happens with many students of knowledge because of technology. You can pull out a recorder on any device now, on phones, on whatever. These recording devices are there and people sit back and relax and they don't actively listen to anything anymore and they just record. And then when do they go back and, re and listen to the recording and take notes? Never, right? They may occasionally, leisurely listen to one of those recordings, but that usually doesn't happen, even the leisure listening. We've got rain. Is that rain? Allahumma sayyib al nafi'an. Allahumma sayyib al nafi'an. Allahu akbar. Faliyafrah al mu'minu. Let the believers rejoice with the mercy of Allah. Allahu akbar. Ah. Tayyib. Um, also, as it relates to taking notes, if you're taking notes to the lectures of one of the scholars or a translation of a lecture from the scholars, then likely that speech or the class you're listening to will be organized. And you'll be able to find the main points. So I advise you to look for the main points when you're taking notes and not to write down everything. Look for the main points, you know? So when someone is teaching and he says, there are five pillars or six principles or something. Get ready to write down those main points as a priority. And as a priority, the evidence from the book and from the sunnah. And not the entire ayat or the entire hadith. But the first few phrases from the ayat. And you can go back and fill it in later. And the first few phrases from the hadith. And you can go back and fill it in later. Allahumma sayyidah nafa. Nice, strong rain. Allahu Akbar. Oh, I want to go outside. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Allahumma ja'alla min al-shakirin. When you, you have to, this is a benefit you can get from me after being 16 years in the desert. Look at that rain and thank Allah for it. Huh? And don't be neglectful in thanking Allah for the rain. Even though you see it a lot. Realize that just like the rich people who have a lot of money, they're ungrateful. The rich people who have lots of money, they don't thank Allah a lot for the money because there's so much of it. Perhaps you are rich people when it comes to rain. And you are neglectful. Yeah, and you don't look at it and say, Alhamdulillah. What would happen if this rain was withheld from you? Your cattle, your sheep, your livestock would begin to die your fruits, your vegetables would dry up. You don't deserve this and you don't have a right to this and it's not your right because you're in Trinidad to get rain. But it's from the blessing of Allah, from the mercy of Allah. So don't forget to thank Allah Ta'ala for that. So taking notes, we mentioned what? Looking for the main points. Trying to find the main points as a priority. Trying to find... Uh, the evidences for those main points as a priority relaxing when it comes to a story being told that backs up a principle just listen to the story don't try to write notes about the story things of lesser significance 
be active in your listening and intelligent in your listening. So you listen for points that are essential, points that are primary points, points that are key, you know, facts and things that are essential for the topic. And then those which are loosely related, side note type of things, additional information. And don't busy yourself taking notes about those. No. And additionally, there could be a number of etiquettes mentioned, but a student of knowledge would be busy and not in this t day and time there's a need to mention, not on the phone, not checking messages on the phone. And if you turn your phone onto either airplane mode or total silence and turn it upside down and don't look at it during your lesson, that's best for you. Why? Because there are people who are good students, yet they leave their phone on silent and they leave the thing to see the screen. And the screen changes, a message came. And he's in the middle of listening to an ayat or an important principle and he wants to see what that person said in, in the message. And so this is from the ways that the shaitan tricks us and takes us away from what is highly beneficial into what is much less beneficial. And there could be a number of points of uh, manners for the students in sittings of knowledge. Another question for a sister who wishes to memorize the Quran as well as some introductory mutun texts, study Arabic and review notes from lessons. What practical advice do you have regarding the best times to study and schedule? Tayyib. Uh, the best times, if, if you are a married sister and you have children, then our sisters know how difficult that is then the best times are the times where you can find time and you've balanced out or you've taken care of all of the duties to your husband and to your children, to your household. Those duties are taken care of. When you have time, then Allah has made it easy for you to get lectures of the senior scholars translated into English. I would encourage all of the people in the Western lands who are trying to work on their Arabic as they work on learning Islam, that they listen to lessons from the scholars more than they read. They listen. They get much more benefit from listening than they do from reading. Right? And listening is a lot easier than reading is on the, stre on the level of uh, stress and the amount of intelligence or, or, or activity that's being used. You listen and you get to learn Arabic as you listen. And you get to learn the real Arabic that is spoken, fluent Arabic, not the Arabic in the book which doesn't tell you how to communicate. Get the difference? You can learn Arabic from the book and through writings, but it doesn't give you the real fluency in Arabic that gives you the ability to communicate, like you would get if you studied from the tapes and the recordings. This is, of course, all of this is when we have an absence of a scholar or a qualified student. Then we go to the tapes and we go to these options as a backup, right? If you are a sister who doesn't have children, then you're, it's a little easier for you. Cooperate with your husband and uh, compete maybe or cooperate and try to study at certain times, set a schedule for yourself. Again, based on what's easy for you, the times like uh, after Fajr are best for a person who will have a strong mind, a strong intellect at that time. Uh, and whenever you find yourself well rested and eager to learn, then learn at that time. Yeah, well rested, eager to learn, then learn at that time. And Allah Ta'ala knows best for the best times. If you're not married at all, then you have less responsibility. Maybe you have some duties to your parents or some duties to your family. After those duties are taken care of, then find a time when you are active and you are uh, eager to learn, then learn at that time. And that's some practical advice. What are the rulings? Oh, it's too hard. I read that. If a person wakes up after sunrise or with time to only pray the Fard Salat al Fajr, can they pray the two Sunnah Raka'at if it is their habit to perform these Raka'at? Uh, in this case, the scholars say, no, you do not. You do not pray two sunnahs if you know you only have a few minutes before the sun rises. At this time, you pray the fard salat to make sure you get your salat in in its time. And it would not be permissible in this case to busy yourself with something that is not obligatory while the time for the obligatory action exits. That would be not, not permissible. And that is a poor, poor decision and a focus 
on what is lesser over what is more important. Right, so in this case, if you know it's only a few minutes before sunrise and you have overslept, then offer the two rakats of Fajr and you can pray the sunnahs of Fajr after the sun rises. Uh, now, and the generality of any sunnah prayer that you missed is that it can be prayed up late. It can be made up later. From the generality of the statement, إِذَا نَامَ أَحَدُكُمْ عَنْ صَلَاةٍ أَوْ نَسِيْهَا فَلْيُصَلِّهَا إِذَا ذَكَرَهَا if one of you sleeps past a time of salah or he forgets it, then let him pray it as soon as he remembers it. Qa'ida an, but for all obligatory and recommended salah and also all obligatory actions and recommended actions. Ibn Abbas used to say that a person, if he talks about the future and he forgot to say insha'Allah, then he can make this istithna up to a year later, whenever he remembers. So he said yesterday, I'm going to the masjid. And he forgot to tell his wife on the way out, Insha'Allah. So he remembers. That day, I told my wife, I'm going to the masjid. And I didn't say Insha'Allah. Then he says Insha'Allah as soon as he remembers. And in that, in the ayat of Surah Al-Kahf, is وَذْكُرْ رَبَّكَ إِذَا وَلَا تَقُولَنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَاعِلٌ ذَلِكَ غَدًا إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهُ وَذْكُرْ رَبَّكَ إِذَا نَسِيْتَ Right? Uh, and don't say about a matter that I'm going to do that tomorrow, except that you say insha'Allah. And remember your Lord when you have forgotten. And some of the scholars explicitly said that means say the istithna when you remember. And Ibn Abbas said up to a year later. And there's no real limit. And he was just saying that as an example to show you how whenever you remember, even a year later, he didn't mean if it's a year and a month later that you don't say it. But he meant even if it's a year later, say it as an example, right? But not as a limit. And Allah knows best, huh? I can't hear you. Is it compulsory? Allah orders us. Allah ordered the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَلَا تَقُولَنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَاعِلٌ ذَلِكَ غَدًا إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ Allah. And don't say about any matter that you are going to do that tomorrow, except that you say, Insha'Allah. There is a story in Surah Nun where people who were disobedient to Allah and intending to be greedy with their garden and not include any poor people and not give charity from their garden, they said they were going out and they're going to get the fruits and the harvest in the morning. And they did not make this istithna. And so punishment came from Allah and destroyed their garden whilst they were sleeping. So for someone who says, Insha'Allah is a recommended form of dhikr and not an obligation, we say, what about the order of Allah to the Messenger وسلم, And then we say, what about the punishment of Allah descending on the people, Ashab al Jannatin? the people who have the gardens in Surah Qalam. What do you say about that? And then even after that, Allah said, The one who is most balanced from amongst them, there was one reminding them to say insha'Allah, but they refused. There's someone amongst them saying, say insha'Allah, say insha'Allah. He says, after their garden was destroyed, didn't I tell you to make tasbih? Alam aqul lakum lawla tusabihun? The tasbih here is the statement insha'Allah, right? Uh, so for someone to say, say insha'Allah is optional, it's good manners and it's recommended but not obligatory, we say to you the texts indicate otherwise. If someone were to say, the great scholar, Shaykh Muhammad ibn Salih al-Uthaymin says in his explanation of Surah Al-Kahf, وَلَا تَقُولَنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَاعِلٌ ذَلِكَ غَدًا The phrase in Arabic is don't ever say with such determination and power I am surely going to do something tomorrow. That that's when you have to say insha'Allah. When you are determined and you are speaking with very decisive language. Right? There's no way I'm not going to the masjid tomorrow. Insha'Allah. That's when you have to add the insha'Allah. And he said if you were saying I'm planning to go to the masjid then you don't have to say insha'Allah as an obligation because it's, you're iffy and you're not speaking decisively. And he uses the language of the ayah, which is what the shaykh is known for, 
a very critical look at the ayat, extracting all kinds of benefits from the ayat. We say in response, Jazakallahu khayran wa rahimahullah, and he's from the best of our most beloved scholars. But in this case, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was being rebuked by Allah for a statement that can be found that he said when they asked him, tell us about such and such matter, what was it, Dhul Qarnayn? Or they asked him about Ashab al -Tahs. And he said, Sa'ukhbirukum ghadan. He said, I'll tell you tomorrow. And he didn't say, Inni mukhbirukum ghadan. Rather, what's recorded from him is that he said, Sa'ukhbirukum ghadan. Which is a light statement of, I'll tell you tomorrow. And he didn't say, Insha'Allah. And that's what Allah, that's the, the reason for the revelation. Wala taqulanna li shay'in inni fa'ilun dalika ghadan. So his action that he was reprimanded for, was not him saying inni mukhbirukum ghadan but his action that he was reprimanded for was saying so ukhbiruka ghadan which is just a light statement of I'll tell you tomorrow so that doesn't work with the benefit extracted by the Shaykh Muhammad Salat al Thaymeen and our scholars taught us to look critically in issues of these kinds of ahkam and it seems to be correct to say in all cases whenever you talk about the future because of the qadr that we believe in, whether you speak decisively or possibly, ihtimalan, either case, say insha'Allah ta'ala as an obligation and don't subject yourself to the anger of Allah and the punishment of Allah, the loss of your property in this life. As from the, from the correct understanding, that which proves its obligation is that you may be punished and lose property that is related to your statement about what you're going to do tomorrow without saying insha'Allah as the people who went out they lost their property it was destroyed as a punishment for them and as a side note or a point of benefit whenever Allah punishes someone for something they've done wrong in this life it's a mercy from Allah and it's guidance from Allah la'allahum yarji'un so that they could come back to what is correct so it's a favor it is a sign from Allah that if you've done something wrong and you feel that something just happened and you lost something and you have been, you're being punished for something you've done, Allah wants good for you and He wants to remind you of the evil of what you've done and He wants you to repent before you meet Him. Because the kuffar, those whom Allah doesn't want good for, He leaves them. And they have money and they have riches and they have wealth. And He lets them prosper. And he lets them gain. And He wants he wants for them what he wants for them. And he doesn't want good for them. Tayyib. So when Allah Ta'ala wants good for someone, he guides them through even his punishment in this life. Notice the people of the Jannatain, what did they say? Inna ila rabbina la ra'ibun, right at the end. After Allah punished them. And after the one, and again also from Allah's signs that they were good people, but had been doing bad actions, is that they had a good person amongst them reminding them even though they weren't listening to him Allah blessed them with good companionship and Allah blessed them with a good end so two, let's say three blessings from Allah for those people whom Allah punished the first blessing was that they were punished in the dunya not in the hereafter second blessing that Allah blessed them with a reminder of a human being a, a companion that would remind them right and then even that he would remind them after he reminded them. Third blessing, that Allah guided them to repentance at the end of the story. In that we are, you know, we, we have, uh, we are anxious and we're ready to return back to our Lord, meaning in obedience. Uh, beautiful thawa'il, how did that come from the question here? What was the question? Next question, is it permissible to read fictional novels? Uh, fictional novels, fiction means non, uh, not true. It means saying there was a man named this and there was no man named that. And saying he had a wife and he had no wife, there was no man. And this happened and it never happened. Our religion is a religion of truth and speaking the truth. And not making up false realities and busying ourselves with falsehoods. The story is false. It's not like when we say in Arabic lessons, 
uh, this is how these people they want to go the scholars of the Arabic language they say to tell you what the maf'ul is and the fa'il and break down an Arabic sentence and Zayd never hit Amr there is no Zayd and he didn't hit Amr hey, we're talking about number one we're talking about one sentence that is to show you the parts of a sentence number two are you sure no Zayd ever hit an Amr because I might be able to name a few Zaids who hit a few Amrs in the history of mankind. So we could actually say that that has some truth to it. And thirdly, that does in no way resembles someone writing a 900 page book about, you know, disbelief and fornication and all kind of stuff that the people read. And they're saying, but in the Arabic language, the scholars say, Look how far they would go with to the point where we're reading non-Muslim fiction literature about things that never happened and things that have no benefit. The Prophet wasallam said, إِيَّاكُمْ وَالْكَذِبِ Be warned about lies. The mokaf, you know, the stance of a Muslim on lies is a serious stance. He doesn't lie himself and he doesn't tolerate lies. He doesn't get entertained by lies. Why would a Muslim who has a religion of honesty and truthfulness and he guards his tongue from lying, allow himself to be entertained by lies. What? For what benefit? Are lies going to help you and relax you and give you entertainment? If so, look to your sins because your sins have overwhelmed your heart to the point that you want to be entertained by lies and you know they're lies. إِيَّاكُمْ وَالْكَذِبِ He said, be warned about lies. فَإِنَّ الْكَذِبَ يَهْدِي إِلَى الْفُجُورِ Because lies lead to wickedness. And wickedness leads to the hellfire. And the Prophet ﷺ did not allow lying, even in a case when he encouraged us to take care of our guests and to honor our guests and to do everything we can do to honor our guests. So imagine that I tell a joke that has a lie in it to my guests. And the whole point is to honor my guests. And I don't intend to lie, but I say a joke that never happened in order to make my guest laugh. طيب. Is it okay? لَهُ I mean, if there's ever a time for lying amongst the Muslims, you would say, here is a joke and they understand it to be a lie and it's just to make the guest happy or relax. But look, the Prophet ﷺ said, وَيْلُ لَهُ وَيْلُ لَهُ وَيْلُ لَهُ Woe to him, woe to him, woe to him. The one who lies in order to make the people laugh. It was collected by Imam Abu Dawood with an authentic chain. Woe to him, according to the scholars of Islam, is a severe warning that necessitates that whatever that is, it must be a major sin. So even in a joke, for you to tell a lie, something that didn't happen in order to make someone laugh, from the tongue of the Messenger وسلم, directly, you have fallen into a major sin. You have fallen into a very serious thing about which he has said, له. This is how much our stance has to be against lies. That we don't entertain lies, we don't have lies as part of our life, and we are not entertained by lies. And we're not reading 900 pages of lies, one of these novels. Right? So I advise um, my sisters in Islam to avoid reading fictional novels. May Allah give them something better. Can people change their last names upon accepting Islam? If you mean by the last name, the family name, then no. The family name stays. They may not change their family names. They may not change their uh, father's names or their grandfather's names. They must keep their lineage as it is. And the family that they are from, alaykum salam wa rahmatullah, the family that they are from remains to be the family that they are from. The family of uh, Abdul Muttalib, the name Abdul Muttalib, right? The grandfather of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was a name synonymous with idol worship. It's the Millah. Idol worship was called the religion of who? Abd al-Muttalib. Now what name, in terms of the advent of Islam and the call to Tawheed, what, what could be worse than a name that represents the religion of idol worship for a person? 
Yet who is our messenger and what's his name and what's his lineage? His name is Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib. He even used to say, Ana nabiyun wa la kadhib, Ana ibn Abdul Muttalib. Right? I'm the Prophet, no lie. I am the son of, of Abdul Muttalib, meaning the grandson of Abdul Muttalib. Tayyib. He never changed his father's name or his grandfather's name. He never changed his name from Hajini to something else. He never changed anything about his name, right? And that is not even a name that's permissible in and of itself. Aside from Abdul Muttalib being the, the name in idol worship, the name itself in a, as a construction is not permissible. Al Muttalib is not one of the names of Allah. So Abdul Muttalib is not a permissible name to even have. Yet historically, that was his grandfather, right? Names are to be changed. And if your name is something like Abdul Shaytan ibn Abdul Iblis, you're the servant of Shaytan, the son of the servant of Iblis. You change your name. You're not Abdul Shaytan anymore. You change your name to Abdullah ibn Abdul Iblis. And you could be the, the servant of Allah, the son of the servant of, of Iblis. Your father's name remains. Right? Unless he accepts Islam, you tell him to change his name too. Otherwise, historically, that's your name, historically. It doesn't mean you approve of your father's name or it's permissible or anything. Best example is our messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who never touched his grandfather's name. It remained as Abdul Muttalib. So you keep your family name, you keep your father's name, you keep your grandfather's name. All of that is part of your lineage and no need to change any of that. Now, so if you accept Islam, and you wish to change your name, and it's not even an obligation on you to change your name when you come to Islam, unless your name is offensive, your name is impermissible in its meaning. If your name is a name like Sarah or Mary or something like that, these names are not offensive, and these names are not impermissible. So you can keep that name as it is. If you wish to change Mary to Maryam, then that's nice. You're not required to take an Arabic name. So long as your name is permissible, then you're okay. Right? You are required to change a name that has a meaning of being a worshipper other than, of someone other than Allah. You're required to change your name if it is a name of Tezkiyah, if you are pure and pious, something like that. Or if your name is any one of those names that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam changed for the companions. Right? Uh, and Allah Ta'ala knows best. Otherwise you keep your name. And so let's say you come to Islam and your name is Mary. You stay, you know, Mary, your name in, in, before Islam was Mary Smith, maybe Mary Ellen Smith, maybe you had a middle name. So you're known as Mary Bint, put the name of your father there, his name is John. You're Mary Bint John Smith, Mary the daughter of John Smith. And that's how you are viewed with the proper Islamic name. You don't become Amatullah Bint Abdullah, you don't become... A, you know, a person of another name ascribed to a father with a different name, you don't lose the name of your father, Barakallahu Fikr. What's the time? Yeah, it's almost at that time. We'll try to take a few more of these. If someone makes dua and forgets to say Ameen, when he remembers, will it be sufficient to just say Ameen, or does he have to make over his dua? In general, as mentioned, the principle is all obligatory and supererogatory acts of dhikr and uh, supplications and whatnot. When you remember, you say them. If you said ami and you intend the dua that you heard and forgot to say ami, then Allah Ta'ala knows that and that will be sufficient for you. And Allah knows best. If a man has two wives and one wife has a way was away, and one wife was away for a period of time, does he have to give those nights back to his wife that was away? Allah knows best. What is the status of divorce in Islam? Seeing that it is hated by Allah, should one stay away from it? And if there are children involved, should the husband and wife work things out? Divorce is permissible uh, and it's for a need. It is described as breaking the woman. The rib is bent and don't break the rib. What's breaking the rib? Divorcing her. So don't break these ribs. 
try to avoid it and uh, build a family. And when there are children involved, then the husband has to be careful about a selfish uh, notion that he's not pleased with the way the wife looks or he's not pleased with certain behavior from his wife and he has to think about a larger group of people that includes not only himself but a number of children who would be affected by such a divorce. He should fear Allah to the best of his ability. To what extent should divorce be the best decision to make? Uh, when it includes removing a harm that would only be established by divorce. If that harm can be removed by another method that's permissible, then that other method should be taken. Can a person recite Qur'an or make dua while in the state of janaba? Uh, it's preferred to make wudu. However, it's permissible to recite Qur'an or make dua in the state of janaba, and Allah knows best. Can women give salam to non-mahram men and can she reply if they greet her? Uh, yes, if it doesn't involve fitna. If there is a fear of fitna, like young people who are not married and they start giggling and things like that, then that is to be avoided. However, salams between men and women are permissible in general. Is it permissible to simply say salam or was salam instead of the entire greeting when writing or texting? No, assalamu alaikum. And then the response being wa alaykum as salam or adding rahmatullah and or barakatuh. I'm sorry, and barakatuh.